Hey friends, welcome to another edition of Math That Matters. Today we're doing LA8, Logic and Argumentation 8, and we're actually doing logic proofs today. So this is the day where you wanna roll up your sleeves. I just took my shirt off. Well, not all, yeah, obviously, yeah. Not my shirt, but my sweatshirt. I took my sweatshirt off, I took my hat off. I feel like I'm gonna need that. I'm gonna need the extra energy. I opened the window a little bit. I went upstairs, I just changed things a little bit because we're gonna get a real challenge today. And as always, you're gonna love it. So let me show you what's up. Proofs, logic proofs. So what you see in front of your very eyes is a logic proof. It looks scary, partially because there's just a lot of lines and they also use some Greek letters, which is kind of scary, but there are things that you ought to recognize there. We've got De Morgan's law, we've got ifs and thens and ands and that's exciting stuff. You're gonna be so good by the end of this. You're just gonna to wanna to go to the weight room and lift lots more weight than you ever thought you could lift. It's gonna be amazing. So what do we do? Well, we try to put things together in such a way that forces sense upon whatever is said. Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky and other poems makes use of logic, but throws in all sorts of silly nonsensical characters and ideas. And yet they're put together in such a way that you make conclusions that seem to be silly, but are valid. If toes are slithy, then the Borogoves are Mimsy. Borogoves are not Mimsy. Therefore, Tobes are not slithy. You see right there, he just used modus tollens. And of course, everyone knows that Tobes are not slithy. Truly dizzying. How will we figure things out logically? So I've got some information. And what I need you to do is I need you to try to look at this information and solve a mystery by rearranging the information, looking at logical equivalents and valid argument forms. So here goes. These are five free truths, free statements or givens regarding a particular situation whereby I've lost my glasses. These are new glasses, by the way, working a lot better. They're a little bit heavier than the other glasses, so. In my agedness, I'm noticing things like the heaviness of my glasses, which is embarrassing. All right, here we go. If I was reading the newspaper in the kitchen, then the glasses are on the kitchen table. All these statements we're gonna take as true. If my glasses are on the kitchen table, then I saw them at breakfast. I did not see my glasses at breakfast. I was reading the newspaper in the living room or I was reading the newspaper in the kitchen. If I was reading the newspaper in the living room, then my glasses are on the coffee table. So what you can do is you can go ahead and pause the video. What we're gonna do is we're going to end up symbolizing these statements, and then we're going to put those symbols together in an argument. So ultimately we wanna know where are the glasses, but to get there, we're gonna have just, we're gonna have more fun. We're actually gonna prove that the glasses are where they are. So if you wanna pause the video, try to do a little bit of rearranging, see if you can figure this out yourself. You can do that. I'm gonna move on to the next steps. All right, so what you see here is in white, you see the same statements we just had on the previous screen. And in other colors, you see new conclusions that we can make if we reorder these statements and make use of the different laws of logics logic and valid argument forms that we have. So you can see also that I'm assigning letters to different statements within these larger and more complex statements. So uh, I was reading the newspaper in the living room, that would be L or in the kitchen, that's K. If my glasses are on the kitchen table, then I saw them at breakfast. I did not see my glasses at breakfast. This should just put something in your brain that says, wait a second, stop, pause, I can do something with that because this is a if kitchen table, then breakfast, then I have not breakfast. And I know that I can use modus tollens. I can turn this statement around number two 
and I can use the contrapositive. If they're not a breakfast, then I know that they are not on the kitchen table, right? So there it is in yellow, modus tollens. And notice I'm writing the statements down, the number of the statements whereby I put those two statements together into the modus tollens argument form to make this conclusion. The glasses are not on the kitchen table. All right, moving on, number five. If I was reading the newspaper in the kitchen, then my glasses are on the kitchen table. But wait a second, that means if my glasses are not on the kitchen table, then I was not reading the newspaper in the kitchen, right? Because that simply is the contrapositive of this. And when we make use of contrapositives, we either state them directly, or we could take probably one step with this skipping an intermediate step here and say, they're not in the kitchen and call that modus tollens if we want to. So modus tollens makes use of the contrapositive being equivalent to the original statement. So we know that the newspaper is not in the kitchen. Therefore, I was reading the newspaper in the living room. Wait a second, where'd that come from? Where, I thought we were talking about the kitchen. Well, this says number one. So if you look up higher, number one says I was reading in the living room or I was reading in the kitchen. And I just figured out that I wasn't reading in the kitchen. Therefore, I must have been reading the newspaper in the living room. That, that's called the disjunctive syllogism, if you remember that. And then we've got this original statement, uh, rearranged, of course. If I was reading the newspaper in the living room, then my glasses are on the coffee table. And I was reading the newspaper in the living room. So therefore, my glasses are on the coffee table. I satisfied the if. That means the then follows by modus ponens. Pollen, <laughs> the glasses are on the coffee table. Pretty exciting stuff, especially when we turn it into this. There's our argument. Look at, uh, I was reading in the living room or the kitchen. If they're on the kitchen table, then I was reading breakfast, but I wasn't reading at breakfast. Therefore, they're not on the kitchen table. If I was reading in the kitchen, then they're on the kitchen table. Contrapositive, they're not on the kitchen table, then wasn't reading in the kitchen. Uh, therefore, they're not in the kitchen. Therefore, they're in the living room. If I was reading in the living room, then they're on the coffee table. But I was reading in the living room, therefore, they're on the coffee table. Look at that. That is a thing of beauty. I just proved that the glasses are on the coffee table. At, at my age, I would wonder where they are, and they're actually on my face. So. Good times for everyone. When we make these proofs, we're actually gonna take away all of the things that are familiar. We won't be talking about Jabberwockies, nor will we be talking about glasses and kitchen tables. We are only gonna talk about symbols and letters today. So that's kind of the end of reality as you know it for this lesson. And we're just gonna pretend like we're playing a game. Now I have a, a secret that you guys probably don't know, unless you're my daughter watching this video, and it is this, I absolutely hate board games. I hate card games. And it doesn't seem like it should be that way, but that's just the way it is. So when everybody says, hey, let's play Catan, I'm like thinking frantically, what else can I do? What else do I have to do? How can I get out of this? At the beginning of COVID season last year, my wife uh, checked out this game, Ticket to Ride from the library. And so we played this like way more times than I wanted to which probably wasn't even that much. But I don't know, I just feel the pressure to think through everything. And I don't know why, I hate board games, but I love proofs. So maybe you like board games and hopefully that means that you'll love, love proofs because I hate board games and I even like proofs. So maybe they're just great for everyone. But here's the thing, when there is a game that you're playing, you need to know the rules. And if you don't get familiar with the rules and you always have to look in the box to see what the rules are, one, it's not that fun, and two, you're not very good at it. So the rules for proofs are critical to get into your head, and here they are. These are our rules for proofs, and you need to, they're pretty much all intuitive, but you need to know the names. So I would pause the video, I would take a picture, I would, I would print this out, I would make, get it into, your vision and get it into your head and of course get it into your heart because you're going to love it. So remember, modus ponens is an argument, 
these are all valid argument forms. It's just an argument that says, if P then Q. P is true, therefore Q is true. Modus tollens, if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. That's simply is using the contrapositive. Then there are these other things. P, therefore P or Q. I can add anything to an or statement if the first thing is true. I can, I can just, something can come out of thin air. I could say, um, I ate a sandwich for lunch or, and as long as I ate a sandwich for lunch, I can add anything else or the moon is made of moldy cheese. So that's kind of helpful because if you want to introduce something into a statement, you can just say, or whatever. Uh, conjunction, if I have P, if I also have Q, I have P and Q, we know that. Simplification is really nice. If I have P and Q, if that's true, I have P. I also have Q. That's called simplification because and means I have everything um, on either side of the and. Disjunctive syllogism, P or Q is true, but Q isn't, therefore P must be. That just makes sense. Transitivity, if P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. And so we've talked through this, the last one, the constructive dilemma is kind of tricky. P or Q, if P then R, if Q then S, therefore R or S. That is a little bit more complex situation and you can always make a truth table if you're not convinced that it's a valid argument form, but it is. So we wanna to try to commit these things to memory or at least put this in front of us. And we wanna do enough problems that we can just name these things and know these things without having to look back every single time. Maybe you look back when it's constructive dilemma or something, but um, most of these things we should be able to remember. So what will we do with them? This is how our author, we're back in the logic textbook now. Our author will give us some free information. He'll say, number one is free, R and S. Remember in the logic book, they use a dot for and. So R and S is true. Number two, T is true. Now what our author does in the textbook is he'll put off to the side over here what he wants you to prove. So he wants you to prove therefore T or L and R and S. Well, if you look at this over here, you think, geez, I don't know anything about L, but if you look at where you're trying to get to, if you look at your destination, and this strategy is called working backwards. So sometimes you look at the thing you're trying to get to and you say, uh, I, I need a T or L. And you go over here and you're like, well, I got a T, T is true. But wait a second, I can add anything to T with an or for free, right? Isn't that just called addition? So if you look at the next slide, you'll see, T or L you can have for free if you want to by adding something to statement number two. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the rule that allows us to say the new thing and then we're going to put the statements required to combine with the rule to say the new thing. Well now we have T or L. We also have R and S which means we have R and S and we have T or L. We have them both, and that's what we're trying to prove. And that simply is the conjunction of one and three. It's the end of one and three. And we're done. That's a proof. I had fun. Not as much fun as I'm going to have uh, when we get to the more fun problems, but that was fun. So baby food. You got to start with baby food, and hopefully it's of the apricot sort, not the, I don't know, green peas or something. All right, here we go. Free things. The free things here, these are called the givens. The thing that you're trying to prove is over here. You're just trying, trying to prove that C is true. So look through your information and see if it makes sense that C has to be true, and then we'll route into the why. So for free, A and B are true. For free, if B, then C. Remember our author uses this horseshoe thing in the logic book. So we have A and B. Now think about that. That means we have A, 
it means we also have B. By the way, anytime you see an and statement, if you want to write two statements um, that are the first thing and then another statement that is the second thing, you can for free. That's called uh, simplification, right? That's one of our rules. So because A and B are true, we know that B is true and we know that B implies C. So we can say B is true with simplification and now we know that B implies C and modus ponens says if B is true and B implies C, then C must be true. That's a verbal, but here it is written out. And at some point today, when we get things a little more complex, then we'll start writing things on my whiteboard over here. So look at, uh, I don't actually think you need statement three. It's not necessary. It's true. A is true. B is true because A and B is true. And that is by rule simplification combined with statement one. And of course, if you use uh, statement four and statement two, B is true. And if P, B, then C, C, of course, must be true by modus ponens. And if you have to go back to the slide and look at all the names of the rules, make sure you're doing that. We're just going to do lots and lots of problems. And I'm actually pulling problems from the same section that I'm giving you an assignment from so that everything you see in this video, it will look almost exactly the same in the homework. All right, let's see. For free, I get this stuff. A is true and B is true. Where am I trying to go? I'm trying to say that A or C and B is true. But wait a second. I can make an A or C statement for free because I can add anything to a statement with an or, right? That's called addition. So look at the next slide. Step three says, uh, a or C is true because A is true. And I'm just adding C with an or, and I can do anything I want with an or. I can add anything to any statement. So A or C is true, but now I've got A or C being true, and I already know that B is true. I had that for free. So by definition, if I have them both, I can say A or C and B. It'll get a little more complicated and more fun but let's do a couple of simpler ones. Free information is over here. Whenever you see the therefore, that's what you're trying to prove. So we'd say, if J, then K, J. Now, it kind of seems like we should just say K, and we can, and we should, but look, at we're actually trying to get beyond K, but we know J is true, and we know if J, then K is true. So by modus ponens, you see that we can say that K is true because we've satisfied the if part, the condition of the conditional. And then of course, if we get to K and we just wanna add L onto it, we can do that for free with the addition rule. So here it is. Of course, K is true. Modus ponens says if we have J and J goes to K, then we can have K. And don't forget when you're writing your assignment out, don't just make the statement and give the reason, but give the statements that you put together to validate your reason for the step that you're uh, writing down. Now, of course, we can say K or anything we want. And so we just add L onto K with an or, and that's called the addition rule. We just add it on to number three. So pretty straightforward. I don't know, maybe I'm doing too many problems of the easier sort, but we'll get to a little more complicated. Actually, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think that the book gives a solution to this one and I didn't like it that much. I, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think I liked something else. So um, I think the book uses constructive dilemma on this one, which is a little more complex and harder to spot, especially if the letters are different. So constructive dilemma says P or Q, if P then R, if Q then S. So you actually need three statements. Uh, therefore, R or S, because you have P or Q, but P, both P and Q route us to these R or S. So whether you're at P or whether you're at Q, you end up at R or S. So it does make sense. Um, I'll show you my proof in a minute, but this is the way the book gives the proof. Um, so we have T. 
and we want t or u, which is fine. We can just add u to t for free using the addition rule to two. And then it just jumps to u or v using the constructive dilemma, which I think is a little bit of a jump and a little bit of a, a trickier amount of thinking than you need. So here's my way. Same proof. But what I did is I said, well, if t is true, and I know t goes to u, then that means u is true, right? By modus ponens. So I got u here. Not that I really need it, but um, because at that point, I could just say u, and then therefore u or v. I can add v on to in it to u, because by addition, I can add whatever I want. It is true that v is also true. Uh, and you can see it. If t is true, and t goes to v, then v is also true. But I didn't need that because I only needed to get to u or v and I had u and u is enough. <laughs> u is enough. I hope this is making sense. How about number 10? Let's see, what would I do with this? Um, and sometimes you, you think about things that are true and maybe you need them and maybe you don't, but maybe you write them down. Like I'm looking at this and I'm saying, uh, if M then N, M goes to N, if O then P, if N then P, and I kind of looked at one and three and I was like, well, M goes to N, N goes to P. I could say if M then P, that might be useful. So it's kind of writing things out and fiddling around. Um, but what am I trying to get to? Oh, and I also have this free stuff. I have this if n then p then m or o, which sort of seems weird. But if you think about it, so this is a conditional statement. And n going to p is given to us for free. So we actually meet the if condition, um, which means we can say m or o by modus ponens. And if we can say M or O, uh, and M goes to N, but O goes to P, that means we can say N or P. That's that constructive dilemma. So that might be hard to think of in your head, but you don't have to, you can write it out. Yeah, see, uh, M or O is a conclusion because n going to p is the if part of this bigger if then statement, and we have n going to p right here. So n going to p implies m or o, and that's why we can say m or o, and that's modus ponens on three and four. And now once we have m or o, we know that we're routed either way from m or o, we're routed to n or p, and that's that constructive dilemma. So really, you need to make sure that you have these rules in front of you and in your head and eventually in your heart. These rules. If you don't know the rules and you're trying to play the game, it's going to get real tricky. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Let's do one more that's maybe not terribly difficult, and then we'll end with two more complicated ones. So let's see. Uh, number one, you have an if-then statement. This is the arrow. If A or B, then not C. C or D is true, and A is true, and we're hoping to get to D. So how are we going to get to D? Um, A or B is true, then not C. C or D. Let's see what we got here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the thing is, you've got A here, which means you've got A or B. You can have that by adding B on. And the motivation then would be to look up here and say, I wish I had A or B. And it's like, well, you can have it. You can have A or B by adding B to A with an or. You get that for free with the addition rule. Look at how many times we've used that. And now A or B is true. So you've met the condition of this conditional, which then routes you via modus ponens to not C. So you go down here and you write not C because you knew you got to A or B 
and that implies not C. But if C is not true, but C or D is true, then that disjunctive syllogism will tell you that D must be true because C isn't, and yet the whole statement is true. Yeah, so that's kind of fun. These are just, just, I mean, what would you rather do with your free time than logic proofs? Okay, this one is trickier. And what I'm gonna do with this one is I'm gonna stop the screen share and I'm gonna twist my computer to my whiteboard so that we can talk through this and walk through this together. So I've got this information on the whiteboard. And let's see. Um, yeah, I think there, I just want to make sure that I've got everything on the video correct. So I'm going to end this. Hopefully you're just looking at the whiteboard right now. Oh no, I've got this spinning circle of death. The spinning circle of death, go away, go away. Okay, this should be okay. And if it's not, well, it should be. I'm not sharing my screen, but I'm not looking at you right now, so. All right, uh, all of this is free information. And what we're trying to prove is in red up here. So I hope you can see that. And we have to start making some statements. So we know that not A or B implies L. We know that not B is true, that A goes to B, that L goes to not R or D, and that not D and R or F is true. And again, we're trying to get to this right here. So if you want to, you can pause the video and you can take a look at the possibilities here. But this is a pretty tricky problem. There's a lot of steps here. So what will we do? Um, sometimes when you have an and statement, you just want to split it apart. And you can do that with the simpli simplification rule. So let's just do that. Maybe I'll use my other color. Let's just say number six. Instead of looking at this more complex statement, we could just say not D. And we can also say R or F by the same rule. And that's just simplification of five. You can take an AND statement, split it apart, and you get both for free, no problem. And how about this? Um, if you look up here, A implies B, but you know not B. Therefore, by modus tollens, you know not A. <laughs> so we could write that. We could say that not A is true by modus tollens on steps two and three. Hopefully you can see this. I think my whole whiteboard is able to be seen. Uh, now, let's see, what do we want? We would like to, and my proof isn't the only proof. So we would like to say not A or B. We've gotten to not A, and for free, we can add B onto this with an or. We can add anything onto something that's true with an or, because if I can get here, then I can get to L. So let's do that. Let's just say not A or B. Let's add B onto not A, and that's the addition rule using eight and one. Um, or actually, no, that's just the addition rule to eight. So addition rule to eight. And then what we're going to do is now we've met the condition on one. So we can say that we have this, that's true, and we're going to go to L. So that means our 10th step is just L, right? So not A or B leads to L. So using modus ponens, we can say modus uh, on nine and one, nine and one. So we've got to L now. And where are we trying to get? So you got to keep looking at the destination. We'd like to get L or G and we have L. So why not just say L or G? We can add on anything to L with the addition rule. 
uh, we can add on with an or. So we added that onto statement 10. We're getting close, I think. So we've got L or G and we want not R. And see, let's see, what do we got? Where can we get not R? Um, oh, look, okay, here it is. We've got L and L goes to not R or D. So we've met the condition of this conditional and using modus ponens, we can say now not R or D, not R or D. And that was modus ponens, the method of affirming using 10 and four, 10 and four. I think we're close now. So we want to get to L or G, we got that, and also not R. So we've got not R or D, and oh yeah, over here, we've got not D, see this? So we've got not R or D, but not D is true. That means that if this is true, which it is, it must be the other thing because D is not true. So we can say not R, and that was the disjunctive syllogism. Disjunctive syllogism on 12 and 6. 12 and 6. And now we're pretty much there, right? We wanted to get to L or G. We got that. And not R. We've got that. So we just conjoin them, right? So we say L or G and not R. And that's the... Uh, conjunction of 13 and 11. Wow, that was cool. I hope you enjoyed that. Let's see, how about, how about one more? You got time for one more? I've got time. Mr. Incredible has time, right? So let's look at one more. What does Mr. Incredible have time for? That'd be a good question on the test. He has time for saving a cat out of a tree for an old lady on his way to his wedding. Good memory. All right, how about this question? What I want you to do with this question is I want you to just write it down and I'm gonna erase my whiteboard and I'll write it down. And um, if, I, if you get started before me, I'm gonna write this down on my whiteboard, then you can start doing it. But I'd love for us to be able to solve this as a, another somewhat complex proof, not quite as complex as the one we just did. J goes to K. J Therefore, M. All right, got it written down. While I'm sharing the screen, I'll flip back to my, on the previous problem, if my handwriting wasn't good enough for you, then you can take a picture of that. That's the answer to the previous problem. Now I will stop the share and let's do this together on the whiteboard. But maybe you've probably already finished it by now, or are you just waiting for me? I hope not. I hope you're thinking through it and figuring it out. All right, let's see. So we've got all of this stuff and we want to get it to M. That's all, we want to conclude M. Well, 
I guess I would look at this and I'm kind of processing all this information. This is free stuff. So I'll use a different color. The blue stuff is free. It's given information. I see K or L and then I see not K. So if K or L is true, but K isn't, that means L has to be true, right? So I think for my fifth step, I would just say um, L and that is that disjunctive syllogism. So disjunctive syllogism on two and four, two and four, okay. And let's see, what else do we got? Aha, we've got not K and we've got J going to K, if J then K, but not K, therefore not J, right? That's that modus tollens, that contrapositive. So with six, we could say not J. And that is by uh, modus tollens on one and four. Remember, you got to state the reason and the statements that you combined together with that reason to come to the next step. Let's see. And where I'd probably need to introduce something to this statement. Um, L and not J. Actually, I've just shown L. I've also just shown not J. So I can say that both of them are, are the case. So I could say L and not J. That's just a conjunction of five and six. So two things that are true, I can join together with an and. And look, now I have met the condition of this if then from number three. So I have this, which means I also get this for free. So I can say in number eight, uh, M and not J is true. M and not J is true by um, number three and number seven combining into a modus ponens. Modus ponens for three and seven. And let's see, number nine. Um, oh, I'm trying to get to M, right? I got to keep looking at my destination. I've got M, I've also got not J, but I don't need not J, I just need M. So if I've got them both, I might as well just say M. And that is just called simplification. Simplification of eight. So there it is. Pretty cool, I think. Yeah, so write that down. And I think that, I think that might be good for this lesson. Remember, you can always go to math lab. You can always come see myself or Neil. We'd love to help you. This stuff I think is pretty fun, but it does take a little bit of time and it takes a commitment to those rules. If you don't know the rules of the game, you're gonna have a hard time navigating. And even if you do know the rules, sometimes you just have to look at things for a while, look at what you have, look at what you're trying to get to. Uh, and sometimes you just write things that are true down and you hope that you can put them together. So it's not always as easy as, oh, this is the next step and this is the next step and now I have an answer. So hopefully that helps. I will see you soon.